Good morning, folks. Uh, welcome to the debut of my Cyber Kung Fu for the CISM with the NIST Risk Management Framework. Um, I, I had run this class uh, uh, earlier, a, a C risk, and it went pretty well. And actually, one of those attendees is about to join us in that class. Uh, and she's the one who kind of said, Oh, you got to do another one. So uh, here I am. I'm, I've done it. Now, the C risk was a lot easier. So it's, it's a somewhat shorter class um, to, to migrate over. And the C risk, I already found that was kind of in that context anyway. We're going to talk more about that. When I say that context, I mean of the. Um, of the, the NIST framework. So this one's a little bit more of a stretch, but we'll figure it out. All right, so our objectives, we are gonna stay focused on passing the uh, CISM uh, exam. I, that's what I've been doing for the last uh, almost two dozen years, is, is helping people prepare for, um, 20 years rather, uh, prepare for certification exams. So I understand when, when people are uh, you know going for a cert, it's one thing to have the knowledge, but you've got to have it in the, in the way that they want it. You know, you're understanding their phrasing and their, their um, angle, their context. I also want you to gain vocational knowledge. Of course, that's the most rewarding thing. And I always say it's like a martial arts instructor. I would like you to get your black belt, of course, but it's much more important that you can actually defend yourself. Right? So uh, I want this to work. And that's a lot, I think, what the NIST framework brings to it. Uh, what I really love about NIST, <laughs> bluntly, is that it's free. And, and they do quality work. But these, because the, um, the NIST special publications, I'm referring to their, their guidelines, the SP800 series, um, by making them so accessible to people, people can review them, or people can go over them, make suggestions. These things are living documents. Uh, in fact, I realized last night that I have an older version of SP-853 controls in my, uh, in, in my first slide. That's OK. We're, we're going to cover in more detail the, the actual ones from version 4, release 4, tomorrow. Uh, but these are, are used a lot. So when you get a job, you can work with these. Now, I've been teaching um, information security stuff, uh, primarily CISSP, uh, starting in 2001, and then CISM, I started in 2005. Um, and CISSP is a, a lot of uh, concepts that come straight from NIST, so I've been borrowing from NIST, and, and, you know, again, because they're free. Well, when the, um, the Department of Defense in the United States in 2014 decide to wave out uh, or phase out their DITSCAP program and, and move to the NIST Risk Management Framework, it just made it, uh, to me, a lot more practical to, to, to even, it put even more focus on the NIST special publications I mean, leverage my existing uh, experience with these guys. Um, number three is kind of a joke here, but it's actually very testable. Get through life using the fewest keystrokes. Anybody here involved in project management? This test, by the way, is a lot like CASP meets PMP. And you may have noticed you can type in your questions. You, you're, uh, don't talk here. All right, so um, a lot of times when I ask a question, it's an excuse to give me time to drink my coffee. Anybody do PMP? People might be fighting for their keyboards. Um, there's the triple constraints. Triple constraints whenever you do a project, and the we're gonna it's gonna really help us understand a lot of this test really. So the number one thing is the scope. No on to PMP. Uh, not into PMP yet. Um, well, you're going to get a nice introduction uh, from it here. Uh, um, and I'll, I'll even mention my instructor, who I, I had BMP class with, Kelly Morrison, and uh, she's fantastic. So, And she's actually one of my competitors for this class, so i got to be careful. I don't want to steer her business. It's mine, but uh, she's really good. And uh, uh, But the, the scope is how much work do we have to get done? A lot of times, that's the answer to this test. You can find out. Well, first, define the scope. Once you are given permission to uh, do something, or once you've been asked to do the risk assessment, what's the next thing? Define the scope. All right. um, so I like to use the example of uh, building a kitchen for a restaurant. The um, 
owner of the restaurant can tell you, hey, you've got this much money and it's got to be done by this date. So they're the other two things. You have the scope and you have the time or the, the schedule and you have the cost or the budget. You're allowed to uh, spend this much money. Welcome, Kashina. Um, so there are, are triple constraints, the scope, time, and cost, or schedule and budget. And that's very important in this class. And a, a lot of times they're going to ask questions um, where there's not one right answer and the other three are wrong. Sometimes they are. They're the easy ones. Um, but a lot of times they're all right. All the answers will solve the problem. But which one actually gets it done in the least amount of time or costs less money? And that's probably, probably the answer. In fact, I'll say which is the most efficient way. Whenever it's a, the answer scope, it's always what is the primary or the first thing you would establish. Uh, getting back to my kitchen, the owner of the kitchen, the owner of the restaurant doesn't really know the full scope of that. Yeah, he doesn't work in a kitchen. He works in an office. You got to talk to people who work in the kitchen. So um, for us to understand the scope, we're going to have to work with the owners of a given process. And we're going to see a lot of that this week. Uh, and number four, uh, the overall objective to me is we're, we're going to make up a stronger future. Uh, that we, we have some uh, crazy times. Uh, anybody watch the news? It, it, I don't know what's crazier, what I think is really going on or what the news tells me is going on. But either way, uh, it, it's very challenging. Um, and, you know, I'm a parent. I've got two children. I, I hope to have grandchildren someday. I'm hoping that uh, we can secure the world for them, you know, like our grandparents did for us. Our, our schedule, and this is, since it's a new class, we're going to be very flexible here. I don't really know how much time. So that's one of the um, the, the, the reasons that they, I, I, I give this away the first time here or, or sell it at a very uh, low price is to um, uh, take into account that I don't really know. This is a beta class for me. So um, we're going to see how well these, these time estimates go. Day one, my goal for today is to this introduction takes me about an hour or so and then um, I really take two CISSP or C, excuse me CISM domains and combine them together so the uh, the first two understanding what is uh, you know security the information security governance um, as well as their second domain uh, information risk management and compliance I kind of cover today we're going to take some practice tests uh, at the end of today if we have some time or early tomorrow for sure. We're covering those two, and we should have gotten uh, the key objectives there. We're going to understand the scope today. We're going to understand what is it we have to get done, and that's going to be working with senior management to understand their direction and our budgetary constraints, our schedules. And we're going to work with the process owners, the data owners, and they're different, by the way. But we're going to be working with the, the owners um, to understand their needs and, and fully. So this would be like working with the, with the uh, cook and, and the dishwashers or so. And we're going to understand their needs of what needs to be in the kitchen. We're going to understand what, what we're going to understand the enterprise. Um, then on day two, we architect solutions to meet their requirements. Well, um, we got to know a lot about these different uh, security controls. So this is where we're going to look at, um, at a high level, 853, the 17 control categories that they control families that they have in, in uh, release four. Um, but we're going to look in depth at some things that I just have, uh, you know, experience in either I just for some reason, you know, in my bias decided to, to explore uh, my experience. I'm a lot of a networking guy, an old network guy, um, a lot of crypto. I find that crypto is the answer to so many real problems. And I find that most people don't understand what encryption does. And that it's especially frustrating when I, I uh, listen to politicians that, um, a lot of times, you know, the word crypt, it means to hide. They come from the Greek. So we mostly think of cryptography as providing confidentiality. 
that's not all it does. If David and I are the only two guys with keys to the filing cabinet, we can hide stuff. But um, we have another service. If David opens up the cabinet and sees something in there that he didn't put in there, he can also validate that it must have come from Larry. Again, this is assuming we're the only two guys with keys to the cabinet. We're going to get much deeper here, but cryptography also provides authenticity. If politicians that want to scale back on confidentiality goals, scale back on our cryptography uh, tools, they're going to scale back our ability to validate the authenticity of anyone on the internet. So we're going to understand a lot better how that works. Passwords, they're basically symmetric encryption. We're going to see how these work. So we're going to look at the, the, the security devices. Now, if you're looking at your test at a high level, the CISM uh, does cover um, IDS, IPS, firewalls, routers, digital signatures, uh, PGP, SSH, all kinds of security controls and devices. And sometimes, anybody here get the uh, the latest um, CISM uh, practice tests? The 2006 practice tests, um, a lot of it, I'd say 70, 80% of it appears to be what's been passed through the years. But I'd say about 20% of it looks new. 10, 20% of it, and they are uh, um, somewhat technical, especially in crypto. I was surprised, pleasantly surprised, because their answers were, they weren't real deep in that how many bits were in the key, but you needed to know the function of a registration authority, which I had never seen reflected on a CISM test, uh, and, and what would happen if uh, you couldn't validate that key. So, uh, Pretty interesting stuff, and, and, and again, they, they, I don't know if the real test is going to cover that, but we'll see. Good stuff. Um, and just overall architecture. So our architecture is, is our, you know, our blueprints of how we're going to meet their requirements. Day three, we're going to run this in operations. We're going to now, well, I have security assessment, operational security and testing. You assess security all the time. But you definitely want to assess it before you even put it into operations. So we're going to have an assessment before we even decide this is good. All right, we're ready to go. But then once we, we decide, you know, it's like buying a car. Uh, or you assess the car. Is this the car I want? Does this behave the way I want it to? Yeah, it does. Okay, good. You're not done assessing it, right? you got to continually assess your car, the security of that car. Day four, um, business continuity management. Now, on in their book, in their book, they have that concept uh, of um, uh, business continuity management worded as incident management. The author of that section seems to understand that that's not what most people do. When I say most people, I'm looking at uh, the people in the business continuity field, and uh, I'll, I'll give you some links later, but uh, my favorite organization for this is the Business Continuity uh, uh, International, bci.org. And that's their website, thebci.org. Um, they look at business continuity management as the big umbrella term. It includes disaster recovery for accidents and, and, and uh, uh, natural disasters and incident management for malicious attacks. Um, NIST uh, calls it contingency planning in SP 834. And they also consider that business continuity is the umbrella term that it takes everything. So I like to use that term. We're going to understand both those so we know how to uh, approach the test because I noticed some of the practice tests is a little hairy there. And then if everything goes according to plan, day five will be our practice test. Now, uh, again, this is my, my goal. I have a feeling day two might go long and we might need part of day three. In fact, some of the things that are in day, that I originally had in day two, I moved to day three, like security administration, so AAA servers and uh, authentication stuff. Um, so maybe you'd say, isn't that part of an architecture? I go, yeah, but I needed to put, take some stuff and uh, free it out of day two and put it into day three. To, to take a test, you have to understand their terminologies. 
If you don't understand terminologies, you cannot come to terms. That's just how it works. That's why it's called terms. Um, a lot of this test is in writing contracts and explicitly stating policy requirements into the contract so people knew what to do. Or security awareness so people were aware of their job, aware of their, their responsibilities. Well, my mother was, uh, you'll hear a bit about her this week, but my mother was uh, very well read. And um, she used to tell me when I was little, everything came from the Latin. But as she got older, she realized not everything comes from the Greek, Larry. She became from the father from my big fat Greek wedding. Uh, so I find it interesting. I take these words apart. And, and cyber, for instance, a lot of people think cyber means something to do with computers. But actually, it comes from the Greek. It means uh, the Kubernetes. It comes from the Kubernetes. He was the, the helmsman or the, to steer the ship. That's the same root word for the word governance, which is a lot about this test. In fact, we're going to have to separate governance from management. Governance is to pick the direction. Management is to get there in the least amount of time and the least amount of cost. Some other things, but yeah. So um, we're going to steer this ship. Now, security is about prevention, detection, and response. We try to prevent it. It's better not to have a problem in the first place. But you can't prevent all problems. To these Greek sailors, if they paid attention to where they were going, they were steering their ship and governing their ship properly. They weren't texting or playing Pokemon Go. Um, they could steer out of the, the way of dangers that they could see. I see it, uh, whatever, uh, a rock out there, steer out of the way. But you can't see all the dangers. The worst danger for these ships are these cliffs underwater. You see the island, it appears to be a few miles away, but actually that island's right in front of you. It's just that some of it's underwater, a good deal of it's underwater and uh, maybe three or four feet underwater. And if your ship hits that, that ship is done. You cannot prevent that danger. So risk comes from that word. These, that's what risk means. These are the cliffs underwater. It comes to mean unforeseen danger. Now you can prevent it. If you hit it once before and you make a record of it, you'll know not to do that again. Or if someone else did it, you learn from them. Right? You learn to, to respect your elders. We even use technologies there. If, if you hit it, maybe you want to put up a lighthouse to let others know. Right? Help people along the way. That's what coaching is. Sharing experience so people can go further than you did. Right. The exam itself is 200 questions. Um, they're much shorter than the CISSP type of questions, if you've been going for that, but they are very, very challenging. They're very challenging wording. Um, I don't know if I really buy their, their breakup here. Security, information security and risk governance, 24%. Information risk, 33 I don't know. It seems like a lot of questions kind of blend into others. In fact, I find in incident management, 18%. They use a term, um, and they've gotten much better in the practice exam. I have to say that they're not doing that here in 2016 so far. I haven't seen. But they use a business continuity, excuse me, a business impact analysis as an impact analysis. And, and so they, they kind of bled over and stuff like that. We're just going to try to get them all right. That's our goal. We're actually, again, covering the first two domains primarily today. Overall, assume and examine this test as if you were a new InfoSec manager. You have very limited authority. Any answer that says fire the guy or pull the plug or update the server, apply the patch, disconnect is probably the wrong answer. That's not our responsibility. We are primarily advisors. If I were you, I would do this. I would do this. Um, if it's an emergency, we might have to do it. The most important thing, I, I uh, tell you a little bit about my background coming up here, but I, when I, I was at IBM for four, year, 
plus years. And I spent a good deal of that time uh, doing work for a trading firm in Philadelphia. Um, we don't unplug things without traders getting well. And the most important thing was that they could trade, not that they had the best security or the best technology. So again, we get the direction, the governance from senior management, and that's that's the, the board of directors, right? Direction. Uh, the CEO is kind of like a liaison between them and executive management. The executives are the COO, CFO, and then underneath them would be the functional. I'm the manager of sales. I'm the manager of HR, the functional managers. But don't overthink it. There's a lot of very technical stuff spattered, splattered throughout the, the uh, exam in primarily wrong answers. Most of the time, the answer is assess the current level of security. Um, uh, perform a risk analysis. Um, uh, analyze the exposure. Right? So it's usually think before you act. We'll talk more about that. That's your due diligence here. Due diligence and due care. Due diligence is to think before you act. Due care is the actions you take. Yeah, think before you act. So before we disconnect, before we update the policy, before we change a standard, understand what the business wants. Review the current state. You might already have controls that are already satisfied. It might work. There's a new law just came out governing the handling of personally identifiable information. What first should the information security manager do? Change the policy and start encrypting the data. And the answer is something. Review this, the current controls. Yeah, they might already work. When I was at the trading firm, uh, they fell under Sarbanes-Oxley. Um, but they told me that uh, SEC guidelines, uh, excuse me, requirements were already more stringent than most of that stuff. Was it Sarbanes Oxley? It might have been Graham Leach Blatley. I think it was Graham Leach Blatley. I'm sorry. Graham Leach Blatley was, was uh, so if you, you were able to meet those requirements, so when Graham Leach Blatley, they didn't have to do anything. Uh, interview the stakeholders. Maybe people are, are uh, they're, they're bypassing some security control or they're they're not the, the system in your test you know it doesn't support the stronger password what should you do uh, tell the, the, the developers to make a better system you know <laughs> call the vendor and tell them to update it and it's like interview stakeholders and assess the risk identify the owner the of the asset or, or, or then the value of the asset Assess the current controls. Analyze the impact. Oh, there's a new vulnerability discovered. They just ran a scan. What should you do? Patch the server. No. Just because a new vulnerability is discovered doesn't mean the impact to you is high. My car is very vulnerable to getting scratches on the bottom of it. It doesn't impact me, so I don't do anything about that. I accept that risk. And verify, whenever there's a report of an incident, your first step on this test is to confirm the incident. And that's real life too. Just because someone says there's a fire doesn't mean there's a fire. It doesn't have to be a person. My fire detectors, smoke detectors go off when I'm cooking a steak. I don't evacuate the premises. Pull the battery out of the dam. <laughs> In the context of the NISC risk management framework, risk management is to first, step one, Here's where terms and terminologies uh, uh, get, get um, mixed up here. Categorize the system. We're going to talk a lot more about that in the week. But to categorize, that means uh, at a high level to at least um, classify high, medium, low, or whatever, you know, top secret, secret. Uh, and where? Is it um, in, in the HR compartment? Is it in a technical compartment? Is it in some mission compartment? So I need to know more about this data item or this system. All right, so we categorize our, our systems, the mail server, and we categorize the information, the actual mail on the server. We find owners for these. Then we select controls, and they're going to come from primarily for us SP853. We implement the controls. We're going to talk a lot about these different controls. And the controls could be, you know, a firewall, but it could also be that we do separation of duties. You know, as a control as well. Then we assess before we put it into production. 
and continuously after it's in production. And that's 853A, which is a companion document to 53. Uh, and Kashina, uh, uh, you're in here. I said uh, you were one of the uh, impetus for me to create this class because you were in my CRIS class and um, you brought up, oh, you'd like to know more about this and thought I should get uh, more detail here. So this is the first attempt. I'm, I'm, my next one is going to do CISSP where I get even more technical in each of these controls. All right, step five, authorize the system. This certification accreditation. This will be the accreditation. Uh, and then once it's into production, I bought the car. You're allowed to buy the car. I'm going through it right now with my 17-year-old. Uh, She'll be 18 next month. And uh, she's about to take her driver's test and uh, about to authorize a, a new vehicle. Well, no, not new. New to her. I told her she's getting an old Honda, an old Civic. Uh, and then we're going to monitor. She's got to learn to check her oil, check the, uh, you know, the gauges, check the, the negative feedback indicators check for in the context of this um, key. Now, if I had like an oil gauge, uh, temperature gauge, right, on the car, I might say, and I'm sure they're built into there before it goes red, yellow, green, or whatever, um, certain, it should be this temperature, well, plus minus 5% or whatever. These are risk tolerances that we measure in key risk indicators. So the oil gauge would be a key risk indicator, and, and when it gets to, into uh, uh, red, it's unacceptable tolerance levels. Right? So we're going to monitor these KRIs. Now, the Department of Defense in 8510, again, this was in 2014, said that uh, we're going to adopt the risk management framework, move away from the old uh, uh, die cap, dead cap, I should say, uh, die cap. Um, and some of the documents we'll look at. Now, really, we're going to be spending more time on uh, uh, the controls. So we'll look at 830 for risk assessment, 834 for uh, contingency planning. The overall thing, we're looking at 837, which is the risk management framework. Um, for the categorization of the system, Department of Defense people have to follow uh, CNN, uh, CNSSI uh, 1253. So that's one thing that's different than the RMF uh, by itself, which is just a guideline to these are requirements. Uh, 853, we mentioned, these are the controls, so now 17 in release 4, and 53A, a way to assess those controls. Actually, they have three basic levels. You have uh, interviewing people. You have uh, I, just identifying or assessing, you're looking at things yourself, observing, and then actually testing. And we'll get into a lot of that on day three. Yeah, so in the um, uh, CNSSI uh, 1253, these are requirements for categorization and control selection. So the first two steps of the RMF are, are requirements now. Your number one security countermeasure is awareness. If you didn't uh, listen, like I listen to the traffic report, it drives my kids crazy, but I like to listen to KYW News Radio in Philadelphia whenever I'm in the car, because I want to know up-to-date traffic information. And then I get to steer out of the way of traffic jams. No, they said 76 is totally blocked up, overturned tractor trailer within the last five minutes. And now I know not to go that way. I know not to steer that way. There's a, uh, a writer I loved growing up, Alvin Toffler. He wrote uh, Future Shock and uh, a book that really helped me uh, decide I wanted to get into computers for a living, uh, The Third Wave. And one of my favorite books on warfare is War and Anti-War by Alvin Toffler. Uh, in The Third Wave, it, the third wave referred to uh, human development, that originally we lived like animals. Then we learned to um, uh, harvest the land. And you'd plant a seed, and even though you couldn't see the immediate uh, you know, benefit, I'm telling you, in a few months, uh, we're going to be able to eat from a plant that's going to sprout from this area. All right? And they learned to, to do that. And, we learned. and then we learned to build machines, the industrial age. And that was only in the last 200 years, right? Start the steam engine, and I'm a big train nut. Uh, 
And so uh, with, with the machine age and the industrial revolution, and then um, starting maybe World War II, but certainly in our lifetimes, the, the 90s and now, the, uh, the onslaught of the information communication age. And uh, people are saying these are the most important things in warfare, you know, it's owning land. Uh, running machines, tanks, you know, play, and now information. Well, uh, Sun Tzu in The Art of War felt that information was always number one. You have to know yourself. You have to know the enemy. And so we'll, we'll talk a lot more about that. But uh, uh, awareness is always real. You got to know. You got to, you know, I, I've been involved in martial arts since I was a youngster. I've done a bit of uh, sparring and, and kickboxing, uh, other things, mixed martial arts. And uh, sure, I got to know my <laughs> Clint Eastwood. A man's got to know his limitations. Uh, but you also want to know the enemy. They're the opponent, I like to say, you know, the other player. Uh, so how, uh, what are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? And I've been involved in information security and in IT for over 30 years. I started my IT career in 85, 84 really, uh, but, but very tail end of 84. Um, so, you know, man, I know a lot of stuff, but I don't know at all, that's for sure. I can't even get, let me see what these practice tests, even with taking them as many times as I have through this year, um, I still can't get 100 more than a couple times. I, I mostly stay in the 80s and 90s. And, and, and a lot of times I disagree with the test. Um, other times, though, you know, I, I disagree. And then a student goes over, no, here's why. And you guys will appoint, will help me understand why that answer is better. You know, everybody has experiences and, and knowledge that no one else has. I, in fact, I had a boxing trainer tell me that that was just how, how it works. He said, everybody knows something that nobody else knows. So keep your eyes and ears open, boy. I like it. So uh, that, that I hope uh, you feel good typing in. And, and the way this uh, class works is with you typing in your st your questions in the chat box, it won't interrupt the flow of my, my delivery. Uh, so it's, you could just randomly as you think it, you know, so you should be more free with your with your thoughts. Um, other students can, can reply, and sometimes they answer before I even get there. Um, and the other great thing I noticed, though, is I can see, like Nicholas typed in a question earlier, and everyone can see it. He's not playing, <laughs> Nick's not playing Pokemon Go. And everyone could see, oh, Nicholas said that. You know, So I find that this is actually an interface that inspires the students to be um, uh, more open and more, more sharing of information. So I hope you feel the same way. All right, just real quickly about me. Uh, but I, 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 <laughs> I like to think of myself as a musician. I have a dream someday of retiring and open up a jazz club and, and doing that. Uh, so at least 10 years away probably from that. Who knows? Maybe sooner, maybe sooner. Um, but I've been in a, a, a punk rock band that we still record now and then, uh, Gung Ho. Same four guys since 1984. Or excuse me, 1980. 1980 we got together. We, were, we grew up together. I've known my drummer all my life. Uh, my guitarist, when we were seven, moved in the neighborhood. And, and bass player, we got him much later. He didn't join us until we were teenagers. But it was at 19 or so. Uh, but yeah, same guys. Uh, my brother and I record. My brother's a professional musician. That's all he does. And, uh, together with the Swinging Johnsons. Um, I also have my ukulele here in my office, and I'll be playing that throughout the breaks and stuff, but whatever. I've been involved in martial arts since I was a young boy. I used to dream of being a martial arts uh, movie action star. Probably not going to happen. I don't know. I'm in my late 50s now, but you never know. Uh, but I've had a, a day job, a hobby, because uh, those don't don't pay very well. And I've been involved in networking since 84. Um, I started out in Netware uh, 86, Netware 86, not, not the year 86. That was only 8086, then uh, 286, 386, then 4.0, and blah, blah, blah. Um, I've been an old packet sniffer guy, wire shark guy. Um, since there, and that's been my my context. So you get the network protocols, you'll see I kind of come alive a little bit there. Uh, but I've been teaching primarily since um, 2000 or so. I started teaching in the late 90s when I was at IBM. Um, I was at night, and I got to teach at night, and there was there was uh, MCSE courses. Um, and then uh, by 2001, I did the CISSP, and that class sold off the shelves, and I was like, wow, I could just do this for a living. So I started doing that, uh, and mostly on the, on the road. Uh, it gets a little old when you have a family, so I am really, really trying to get these live online classes uh, 
to be my primary uh, income here these last five or ten years before I retire. Uh, so I do now primarily CISM, CSSP, the C-Risk, and Wireshark classes. So do some packages. I still do some consulting. In fact, I, I just had to do a, a, a quick uh, assessment the other day uh, on a, um, a Java app making an SSL call uh, that was going through a WebSense server. Not, not, uh, it's kind of funny. Anyway, um, uh, when I do consult, it is mostly protocol analysis, and it is mostly availability issues. Most people think of security as confidentiality. Anybody here ever hidden something so well that you yourself don't know where it is? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I will argue all week that the most important thing is availability, and that's a great a uh, bias to take for this test because they want to make sure the business is still running. Whatever you do to secure it better not prohibit their ability to get their work done. Right? It's going to slow you down somewhat. Security tends to slow, slow us down, slows me down to brush my teeth, slows you down to stop at the red light, stop sign, slows you down to look both ways. But if you don't, it's unreasonable. You, you, you're, you're at risk and other people are at risk. So um, we want to understand that security tends to slow us down. We want to uh, architect controls that are as transparent as possible. I see that a lot on day three. But transparency of controls means that the user didn't notice or noticed very little. The more transparent, the less they noticed. This test is an English test more than anything, really. I also got to be an author. I co-wrote the uh, CEH official study guide. I used to teach CEH for a few years. Um, yeah, too much uh, lab requirements there. <laughs> I had some issues with that one. Uh, it's, it's, it's fun stuff, but I also uh, have my issues with it. But I, I did write the uh, crypto sections. That's all. Actually, Stephen Defino wrote 95% uh, of that book. One of my uh, martial arts coaches is uh, Joe Lewis, not not Joe Lewis the boxer. Did I close? I have to open that up here. Well, I'll show you who Joe Lewis is. Martial arts. There we go. There he is. That's Joe. Uh, Joe. Um, well, he's a great guy for me. He hated Masters, and uh, he died in 2011, or 2012, excuse me. His last class was in 2011. And um, it was uh, Tampa, Tampa at, at a, at a uh, uh, big conference, our yearly conference. And as he was taking off his gloves for his last uh, uh, class, he said, guys, when I'm gone now, you know, he had cancer. He was gone. It's, uh, don't go teaching Joe Lewis style. That'd be stupid. The only things you can honestly teach a man, there are things you can make work. Now, I'll bet you there are things you can make work that I never made work. And you don't want to deny your students that. And there are probably some things I could make work that you could never make work. All I ask, all I hope, is that some of the things I taught you work for you. But don't go teaching Joe Lewis style. I love it. So he was a good friend of Bruce Lee's. And Bruce Lee had told us that, uh, that you know, styles limit you. So. Uh, there they go together. A couple pictures of them together. Um, they, they uh, there's Bruce congratulating Joe after he won the heavyweight kickboxing championship. Um. Bruce created his own style to, to escape styles. He called it Jeet Kune Do. And then when he died, Joe Lewis said, well, why would I go teach him Jeet Kune Do? I'd be missing the point. So he made his own style called Joe Lewis Fighting Systems. He <laughs> said, but uh, don't go teach him Joe Lewis style. So I call my style Cyber Kung Fu. Um, I could do things that Joe couldn't do, uh, particularly with, uh, with Wireshark. <laughs> uh, 
But uh, and there there are some things he definitely taught me that work for me. I've seen to work for me. Um, but I I also do as a play on words. We know that cyber means to steer. Kung Fu is another very misunderstood term. People think Kung Fu means something to do with martial arts. And no, Kung Fu just means spend time and energy on a subject. When a man spends time and energy on something, he's going to get better at it. And it's Malcolm Gladwell's point and like the tipping point. You know, uh, if you've never heard of the author, he's fantastic. And he says, um, it takes about 10,000 hours of, of investment of time before somebody becomes a master of something. A 40-hour work week or whatever, you'd figure after... Uh, uh, five years, you know, the, the, it becomes a master carpenter, something like that. Our triple constraints. Yeah, we have to understand the scope. Understand of what, what is it I need to get done here. And then understand that you have constraints. You don't have unlimited budget. There's a couple of practice questions that crack me up. They say, for an organization with a limited budget, so what organization has an unlimited budget? Uh, whatever uh, and and cost constraints so we want to solve the problem we want to meet the scope never short scope it so if we're building that kitchen and they ask for tile we don't just save money by putting in linoleum no they said tile so we got to find we're going to find a tile that doesn't cost as much hopefully be a, a good process that allows us to put the tile in in less time you know if anybody here work with tile, you know, one way of course is to get somebody else to cut that <laughs> tiles for you. Or well, you're going to crack a few tiles. Process management. This is kind of how I've uh, architected this class, uh, our days of the class. So today we're in the planning. We're going to look at uh, uh, what is it we're supposed to do. Well, Edwards Deming uh, was the guy who helped re-engineer Japan after World War II. He had come up with this concept. Actually, he had got it from his uh, teacher, Walter Stewart. We'll talk a little bit more about that in the next section here. But um, basically, you, you make a plan. As a musician, uh, these are the songs we're going to play. Then we get up on stage and we do it. We play those songs. Then we check. We're... Uh, Play back the uh, the tape, record it, you know, and then see, you know, on that third song when it seemed to go weird. Who did that? Who who made that mistake there? And then act, improve. Well, let's re rehearse that song and make sure we, we know the time. Remember, it's eight measures between the break and the, the uh, whatever change there. Um, so that's kind of what I've done. Today we're planning. Tomorrow we're going to be doing. Day three, we're still doing. We're administering. But we're also going to be checking. We're going to be assessing, testing, monitoring, auditing. Right. And then whenever you uh, test or audit or whatever, you're going to find problems. And our goal is to make it better, make a better plan. Process improvement. Of course, our, we have a day five where we take a test on it and really check. I want this in your heads up display. This is one of the most important things for us this week. And it's also how I've architected my class. I've noticed too on the practice test, there's a couple of point, times when they call the S, the guy refers to as the software development life cycle. It's actually system. System development life cycle is a much more common term for that. That's what NIST calls it and most people call it in my experience. They're going to develop a system. We're, we're, we're going to have a system to how to pass this test. Well, in security, there's no feasibility study. For me, as a, as a songwriter, I might go, ah, I've got an idea, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have like, a, I need a choir to sing uh, like a church type, no, Larry, you don't have access to a choir, it's not feasible. All right, never mind, maybe I'll find some, some samples, the preset samples. So you might have a feasibility study in an application. In a security project, you don't do that. It's not like, should I get insurance for my car? You will do it. Then project management or project initiation. This is when senior management gives us our basic description of the scope, our schedule and our budget. They assign authority. They said, we're going to go forward with this. We're going to have a, we're going to, we're going to buy this new car. All right. Then we figure out what are requirements? What do we need? So functional requirements to the car. Well, it's got to be able to uh, whatever, pull a, a one and a half tons. I don't know. It's got to be able to hold seven people. Assurance requirements. Uh, I want it to be able to uh, have a lifetime warranty on the drivetrain. Uh, I want uh, tires that last for at least 70,000 miles. 
these are the user needs. This is when you work with the cook and the, the, the uh, dishwashers in the kitchen. And we further understand the scope. Heads up. This is considered the hardest part in a development life cycle. It is the hardest part because sometimes people don't know what they want. Because by the time you'd finished it, they don't want it anymore. And it took you too long. But possibly the biggest problem here is that you didn't understand them. When they said, bring me a picture of a dog tied to a fence, you thought they meant take a picture of a dog and tie it to a fence and bring it to them. But no, they wanted a, you to tie a dog to a fence and tie, take a picture of that. The same sentence means the same thing. A picture of a dog tied to a fence can be interpreted a couple of different ways. This is the hardest part about taking a test. When I get these questions wrong on the test, it's very commonly that I looked at it, oh, I thought you meant blah, blah, blah. That could be interpreted a couple of different ways. We'll talk more about that later, but to me, this is the hardest part in life. It's what makes getting along with people so hard. And I read one author said, you know, not usually that there's a good person and a bad person that get into an argument. Arguments are mostly misunderstandings. All right, let's assume we understood that. And we're going to be through this today. That's our goal. Tomorrow, we're going to design, we're going to architect solutions using the controls that we know about that can be put together in such a way to satisfy their needs. Now, to ensure that I actually heard them right, where was my tools? Isn't that funny? Ah, there we go. To make sure I understood senior management's scope and budget and schedules and the user needs to make sure I understood this. I, as the security architect, I'm going to write a paper called the security strategy. I wish they'd have a typing thing on go to, but they don't. My architecture is there to implement the strategy. This is what I want to get done. Architectures are how. All right. A lot of this class is going to be what and how. Policies are what we want to get done, what the users need to do. Standards, procedures, baselines, guidelines, that's how. So we'll talk a lot about that. Then we build or buy, develop or acquire things that that meet the architecture. So uh, when I when I architect the blueprint for the kitchen, I'll say, all right, in the architecture, put in 30 amp uh, circuits here and 20 amp circuits there and whatever two inch pipe here, one and a half inch pipes there. Uh, they got to be, you know, whatever tile floor. Well, when the developers, when the subject matter experts that come in and, and build according to the architecture, they will look at the architecture checklist. I'll, I'll have a detailed checklist in the how. Well, and again, it's a 256 bits of encryption. It's going to use AES. Um, they verify to ensure they're building it properly. Verification means, am I building it according to design? Then we're going to install it together. We're going to build the, the kitchen up, and we're going to test it. We're going to have the cook. We're going to have the, uh, the the dishwashers. Now, in a way, I can have the electrician test the electricity. That's unit testing. You could have very good units, but not a good system. Uh, I could buy the best nails, the best wood, and the best hammer. That doesn't ensure I'm hammering the nails into the wood properly. So it takes a user to accept 
the system. That's that test. The user acceptance test will validate that this thing implements their strategy, that it, it, it's what they needed. So if verification is, am I building it right? Validation, does it work right? All right, yeah, we got it. We, we, we got the kitchen. This is perfect. It's beautiful. You know, the toughest part about a kitchen is maintaining it. You have a beautiful kitchen when you first move into a house. But with every delicious meal you cook, right, there's something to clean, isn't there? And you got to, well, you know, the cook can, can monitor the, uh, the, 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 the cooking stuff. The, the, the uh, dishwasher could monitor the dishes and stuff. Look and make sure, yeah, it looks pretty clean. But I want a third party to come in there and say, wait, this dishes literally clean. Then it's like uh, your car, you know, you, you, uh, you're you going to operate your car. Once I get my daughter a car, the, the, it's not over. She's got to maintain that car, right? get the oil changed and stuff. Uh, she can look at it and monitor, but uh, I let that take a look or let's take it into the shop every X amount of miles and, and have them look at it. Now, when you retire uh, a system, you might not be retiring the process. I might get rid of the car, not because I'm going to stop driving, right? I'm just retiring that particular system. Uh, when you retire a system, data remains on it. What are you going to do with that? Now, from a confidentiality perspective, you might worry about, oh, we, could, we had to scrub it, dude. We had to, this is top secret data. We had to degauss it, electromagnetically wipe it, and shred it. Mm -hmm. No, we're not a top secret. This is a mortgage company. Those records were supposed to be preserved for 30 years. How am I supposed to see the data that remained? Validation didn't catch it all. Oh, I'm sorry. Validation is making sure that the user, that's UAT, user acceptance test, right, that the user says it met their needs. So if you designed it wrong, you know, like, all right, so the user wanted a picture of a dog tied to a fence. And what they meant was uh, take a picture of a dog, uh, actually, actually uh, put a, tie a dog to a fence and take a picture. But you misunderstood you designed, all right, somebody needs to take a picture of a dog and tie it to a fence. So the developer takes a picture of a dog and ties it to a fence. And he met the architecture, said, yep, I did. I verified it. It passed verification. But when we came down to install a test, the user looked at it and said, no, that's not what I wanted. I wanted you to tie a dog to a fence and take a picture of it, not a photograph of a picture that had to be tied to a fence. So it failed validation even though it verified properly. Does that make sense, Houston? Cool. All right, so data remnants, don't just think of confidentiality issues, think of availability issues. And they're gonna talk a lot about the data retention policy. The data retention policy, so this data has to be retained for X amount of years. All right, clear that up. Anybody read that wrong? Hardest part of the test, hardest part in life is understanding. And we tend to hear what we want to hear, what we expect it to hear. And we block out anything that didn't. I watch the news and if you're extreme left, you don't hear the stuff on the right. You just don't hear it and vice versa. Very funny. Hardest part of the test, make sure you read it right. Anybody here ever take practice tests and, 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 and realize you got something wrong because, oh, it says which is not one of the following. My overall advice for this test is to read everything carefully. You know, they came out with the, the C-Risk uh, a couple years after the CISM. And there's a lot of overlap. What are the basic differences? All right. Officially, the CISM is a more senior position. Their job is to develop the strategy, and the C-Risk is more of a hands-on. They implement. They implement the strategy. Uh, but I've noticed something else unofficially. The CISM came from the UK, and uh, the 
books, uh, and I've noticed the practice test seems to have changed in 2016. I'm seeing more U.S. English, but I saw a lot of the Queen's English, if anyone's uh, read through the CISM books from previous years, up until the last year. Uh, it was like the organization, you know, not organization. Um, you don't have rights or capabilities, you have entitlements. That's still there. Entitlements are still in the print. Um, and the controls are mostly international. And I said primarily based on ISO, and, and I think I noticed stuff from like uh, ITOL and, and other, you, you know, uh, international best practices. Well, I'm getting a warning that I might be discerning some degraded audio. Anybody hearing a problem there? I sound okay, everybody? Okay, good, good. Um, the C risk, I, I get that book a couple years ago and I read it and I go, oh my gosh, this is like right out of NIST. So unofficially to me, the C risk was right in line with NIST terminologies. So if you're familiar with the, the RFM, that's why I use C risk as my first class to, to uh, migrate over and, and, and in, implement the, uh, or integrate the, uh, NIST uh, RMF is because it was already in that context. You have the things you know that you know, the things you know that you don't know, but it's what you didn't know that you didn't know that gets you. Oh, really? I believe there's a fourth choice in that equation. What about the things you thought you knew, but turned out you were wrong? And I will argue that that is the most dangerous thing in security. It certainly has been some of the cause of the biggest mistakes of my life. All right, and uh, there's a, uh, it reminds me of something my mother used to say. I have a slide for in some of my other uh, material here. I didn't do it here. Um, but my mother used to always say, be worried that people aren't telling you the truth. And she, she'd tell you, how, oh, that's what they want you to think, Larry. Um, I, I uh, thought I was a good artist when I was a kid, and I, uh, I used to be a big comic book fan, and I drew, uh, if you could draw a picture of Skippy the Turtle, Sometimes it's Freddy the squirrel. Send it into us, and we'll have a team of experts go over your drawing and decide whether or not you have the aptitude to take lessons from us at a correspondence art school, which will cost money. That's my mother point. Yeah, see if you have the aptitude to take to give them money. So I show her the picture. I said, "What do you think?" She goes, "Oh, you're going to win." I said, "Oh yeah, it looks just like it. Everybody wins, Larry." No, it says a team of experts is going to go through. I know, Flowery, that's what they want you to think. You know what they want? They want your money. And I've learned that she's mostly right. When people talk to me, I don't necessarily assume they're telling me the truth. I do assume that they're telling me things they want me to believe. And I also assume that they might very well want my money at the end of this transaction, especially if they stop you in Center City, Philly, and tell you to say that their car broke down. I doubt that their car broke down. But I do believe at the end of that sentence or conversation, they're going to be trying to separate me from some money. It's the things you think you know. So I have a chest of drawers up here. Let's say there's a drawer that says shirts. And when I open it up, there are shirts in there. Yeah, well, that's things I, th I knew that I knew. Right? That's the uh, a true true. I thought there were shirts and there are shirts. Then another one says private. I don't know what's in there. It's locked. But I know there's something in there. I know that I don't know what's in there. There's a secret panel in the back. Didn't even know that. I didn't even bother looking there. Things I didn't know that I didn't know. But that's not where my missing shirt was. Nope, it's actually in the drawer marked pants. I didn't even look there because I just assumed there were pants in there. Most security violations work that way. That's how the Smurf attack works. I thought that IP address was from our network, right? That's how um, uh, phishing works. I thought that email was from my bank. That's how Trojan horses work. I thought that was a handy utility. So social engineering in general works. He said he worked here. Let's keep that in mind. If the number one security control is awareness, then probably the number one way to uh, throw people off is to make them unaware, make them think they're aware. False information. Attacks on information can be at a very broad level, passive or active. 
A passive attack is when somebody's just listening to you. They're not sending anything. So I like to think of an Ethernet cable. I have a send pair and a receive pair. Here, I've cut the send pair. I don't even send any information. If somebody's on the other side of the room I'm in right now, listening to my conversation, I can't tell. There's nothing to pick up. Passive attacks are undetectable. But I could have soundproofed this room. I could have turned a stereo up for that. Could have encrypted the data. They are preventable. An active attack is when somebody's doing something. Somebody keeps calling me up on the phone, keeps calling me up. I can certainly tell when that happens. Sin, somebody keeps sending me sins. I can tell when that happens. I can't stop it all. We got botnets in the, uh, you know, millions. You got 30 million machines attacking you. You can't prevent all that. You cannot prevent all distributed denial of service attacks. Forget it. Covert channels. Anytime you send communications through some medium, there's no way to, to, to guarantee it's, it's valid. So at a very high level, uh, and we'll look at more on day three, but, uh, or day two, excuse me. And, uh, I have friends in China. And I know that they have a very aggressive firewall policy, the Great Firewall of China. They look at information coming into and out of that country. But they allow email. So if I previously agreed with my friend, hey, you get an email with my uh, Yahoo account, from my Yahoo account, write down a one. But if it's from my Gmail account, write down a zero. And I could, you know, it might take a while to sneak out an MPEG of a movie, but I could sneak out a, 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 a password in one day. They have questions on this test, by the way. The biggest uh, covert channel I know on the test is uh, steganography. Steganos it means to, to uh, cover something. Stegosaurus was covered in plates. So you cover a message in another message. Governance is about direction. I have theories in the world, you know, as you get older and Kung Fu teachers were philosophers, you know. I, 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 when I was a teenager, I read a book by Jared O'Neill called The High Frontier. And he addressed uh, things like global warming and pollution and stuff. And he, he felt that uh, well, his students, he was a, a professor at um, Princeton, that the answer to these things was to move manufacturing to space. Yep. This is in 1976, they, they wrote, he wrote this book, you know, um, Al Gore didn't invent the uh, concern for, you know, uh, the changing environment. Um, and the answers were not to him greater, greener technologies or going back to simpler times. He said, we'll never go back to simpler times. And greener technologies, uh, even if we could get them as efficient as the, as the dirtier technologies, it, how do you enforce that everybody around the world is going to do it? So very tricky. He felt that most of the damage, 90 plus percent, was done in manufacturing. If you move manufacturing to space, most of the damage goes away. Now, uh, that's a long commute, so they design habitats to live in space. And these the designs still hold up. I just saw there was an article in uh, Scientific American, I think, in June that uh, said, that, you know, people were coming back and looking at these again, that these things still hold up. Um, this first uh, design was actually the, uh, the most expensive, even though it was the smallest, built to house 10,000 people. Uh, but all the material had to be built from Earth. Anybody see there was a, a, a company, I think it's an Indian company, got the right to, to um to work for, on the moon from NASA. So uh, people, they want to mine the asteroids. They want to mine the moon and, and, and bring resources there. So uh, this design, the Stanford tour, so was 100,000 people. This was made famous in movies like, um, uh, most recently, uh, Matt Damon, um, oh gosh, Elysium. Um, and 2001 Space Odyssey. And this last design built to house uh, 20 million people. And uh, that was a, a big in a cartoon, a Japanese cartoon. It still is big. In, in, uh, mobile suit gun. Uh, well, I fell in love with these concepts as a teenager. So it's inspired me to uh, be a, a computer guy. Uh, I said, I want to, I want to, you know, someday I don't know that I'll ever make it to space. But if my grandchildren make it there and they say, Pop Up was right onto it. He was, you know, always telling us and stuff. So, uh, and, and I get the graphics from all my slides from these things that by Don Davis and Rick Guidas, they give them out for free. They do say, please give them credit. So here, I'm giving credit to that. But it, it's a direction to me of humanity, of where we're going. And um, Timothy Leary, a, a, a 
scientists I used to love to read when I was a teenager, uh, felt that um, the, the malice, he said, that the crisis that the human race is going through is mostly navigational, primarily navigational, because people have lost the map. He said, they don't know where we're going. And if you think you're, you're, you're not going anywhere, uh, then, then you're going to wander around aimlessly. Just uh, life doesn't matter. But he felt that we were going somewhere. We were designed that the first men to, to uh, in the NASA program or whatever to, to go into space and the Russian cosmonauts will be looked at thousands of years from now as significant as the first fish to smell air. That this is a natural thing. We, we, we have to move into space. And uh, one of my favorite books in, in, um, uh, on governance in general, really, in cyber theory was Dr. Seuss's Oh, the Places You'll Go. So I don't know if anyone's got children out there. It's my favorite kid's book. Absolutely. My kids know it by heart. Congratulations. Today is your day. You're off to great places. You're off and away. You have brains in your head. You have feet in your shoes. You can steer yourself any direction you choose. So you'll see these graphics, the background of my slides, and give you a little bit about my uh, my bias. I really believe that um, we are going somewhere, that we are moving into space, and we are building these colonies with the same reasoning that a bee builds a hive, because it's a genetic imperative. I'm also a big Star Trek fan. You're going to really notice that, by the way, as we go through the slides. Uh, a lot of, uh, you know, to me, Kirk is going to be our governance guy. Kirk is our, our qualitative, subjective guy. Um, but uh, Spock will be our ob objective, quantitative reasoning guy. And there's so a lot of me, you know, some people walk around and they think of like, you know, you got a devil and an angel advising you. Well, we're going to have Kirk and Spock advising us. And to me, the, the Federation is the ISO. It's 151 or 61 member body nations now from Afghanistan to Zimbabwe. And to me, they are like the Federation. They help us all work together. And for instance, I don't care when I drive down the road what music you listen to in your car. That's your business. But I do very much care that you stop at the red light and let me go during the green light, right? We have raised certain rules so we can all share the road. And the ISO has developed a bunch of standards so we can share this information communication highway. Now NIST is guidelines. FIPS is as standards. We're not going to be really covering FIPS. We're going to be covering NIST. There are guidelines. Uh, and a lot of the ISO standards actually tell you and defer you to NIST for more information. So they work very closely together. All righty, so our, our goal here again, uh, we want to pass the test. I, I hope at the end of this you feel very, very ready uh, to pass the CISM exam. Uh, that's what I primarily do is create uh, information uh, security certification, exam certification um, uh, training programs so you can increase your likelihood of passing this test. Uh, but I also want you to understand enterprise risk management. How do we reduce risks to getting our job done? So, uh, you know, for instance, uh, much of my career, I, I drove from Philadelphia to, uh, to Virginia every weekend. Um, and I, I'd want to get down there. Uh, well, where's my scope? Get to Virginia. Uh, <laughs> get your car down there with, with your laptop. Get down there, uh, time and budget. As cheaply and as quickly as possible. Well, I could blow the tolls. I could, my car will do over 100. But that's not safe for many reasons, right? I could get in an accident or I could get arrested. So we want to be uh, uh, reduce the risk to doing that. We want to understand how these controls work, and it can get very technical on the new uh, practice tests where they, you know, from from uh, IDS, IPS, DMZ architectures have always been pretty big on this test um, to cryptographic controls, understanding how PKI works. And then ensuring that once it's running, I got the car, I bought the kitchen or the kitchen's installed. How do I maintain the kitchen? How do I ensure that this, this knife is really clean? That these dishes are really clean. How do I make it better? Even though they're clean, they're foggy. Can we get something that, that takes that fog off? All righty. Uh, we're, we're ready for our first break here. Let me stop the recording. <laughs> 